If I could get you to turn in your Bibles, we're going to be continuing now our, our, our look in Exodus chapter uh, Exodus chapter 19. We've been following through over this past number of, of weeks with the, the early part of the release of the people of, of Israel from, from slavery and now as they're, they're continuing to, to follow God. Um, I have to confess at the outset when I was preparing all week that I had come up with one sermon and then I completely changed all of that and got something completely different. And then I went with that into Ballandary this morning, still taking out bits as I was going on and then realizing that I'd still got my timings way long. So I could have saved myself a lot of time this week, I think if I just ignored the first half of what I've written, which, I, which is what I'm intending to do later on now. And that... We might see this passage today, as I've already been praying, with a sense of God getting his people ready to meet him. That this might be, even as we gather today in our understanding of it, that God is calling us together, that we might hear him. And that as God calls us together, he calls us to get ready for what God is yet to do in our lives as individuals and in our corporate life as a church. So that's the, the, the as it were, the, the lens through which I'm going to read this passage today. Uh, Exodus chapter 19, let's hear God's word as we, we listen to, to this passage. Verse 1. On the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day they came to the desert of Sinai, After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now... If you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The Lord, the people all responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and you will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Make them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day, because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, Be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. They are to be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on them. No person or animal shall be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may they approach the mountain. After Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them and they washed their clothes. Then he said to the people, Prepare yourselves for the third day. Abstain from sexual relations. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up like the smoke from a furnace and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up, and the Lord said to him, Go down and warn the people, so they do not force their way through to see the Lord, and many of them perish. Uh, 
Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves or the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai because you yourself warned us, put limits around the mountain and set it apart as holy. The Lord replied, go down and bring Aaron up with you. But the priests and the people must not force their way through to come up to the Lord or he will break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and he told them. And we pray that the Lord would add his blessing uh, to his truth. Amen. As I was mentioning, I'm trying to look at this Bible passage this morning uh, through the prism of God getting his people ready for something significant and something new, perhaps a new direction that God is, is taking. Well, in our, we're applying it immediately, speaking to you about how you might uh, go in, in a new way with God, or God is getting you ready for, for that, something new that he's doing in your life. Certainly, he was getting the people of Israel ready for a significant new thing that he was going to do, where he was going to come and he was going to presence himself in a spectacular way. Now, To get to that stage, you have to be alert to God. You have to be ready in heart and mind and, and, and aware that there's a readiness, a receptivity, as, as it were, within your heart and mind so that you are ready for God to speak in so that when God comes and he speaks and you, are, you have that unmistakable assurance that this is the voice of God to you. It may be actually in recent times that you have been aware that God has been speaking to you uh, could be, you know, could be a change that God is calling you into, uh, even with with career, any of those sorts of things. Could be uh, maybe just something in, in your own life or as how you follow God and something about your own discipleship and and how closely you're chasing after Him. God is speaking to you, maybe even about a personal sin, and that He's asking you to give something up and He's calling you to follow Him, follow Him a, a little bit more resolutely. But God is getting you ready, and He's speaking to you so that even as you come to church today is that God has you here so that God is going to speak to you. And that should be our expectation, that as we walk through those doors, that God is going to speak. Even as we're at home, we are ready to listen to what God is going to say to us as we open our Bibles and we want to hear God addressing us. But we're also aware that life is full of distractions and that life is busy and that you may not be... <laughs> ready for God to speak into your life simply because you are so distracted. And I don't know what your Sunday morning has been like already. Um, I'm going to get a, a little video clip. This is a little one that, that I like because it typifies, I'm sure, your, I'm thinking here principally of young families. This is your Sunday morning experience. Oh no, I couldn't eat another bite. It was delicious. Sure was, Mom. I love everything you cook. Aw, thanks, honey. Dear, what time would you like to leave for church this morning? Well, I was thinking at about 20 until 9, if that would work for you. That would be perfect. That's exactly the time that I was thinking of. Oh, hug. Say, Mom. We still have about 45 minutes before it's time to go. We can clean up the dishes while you go have some quiet time. Oh, thanks, honey. I think I will. I think I will. Okay, kids, let's see who can get the most work done in the least amount of time. Uh-oh, there's only one game back here, sis. Here, you play first. I'll play when you finish. Thanks, I'm so blessed to have you around. Not as blessed as I am to have you. Hug. Where? 
down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down. Oops! Silly me! I have my NIV Bible and my New American Standard, but I left my new King James in the car. What if the pastor reads from that one and I don't have it? Don't worry, Mom. I'll get it for you. Aw, oh, thanks, honey. Yikes! What is it, dear? I just got mud on my dress. Well, that's all right. I'm sure that if we all close our eyes and think a happy thought, it'll be fine. <laughs> See? I told you. You're so smart, Dad. You're the wisest man I know. Oh. Hey, maybe over lunch we can all share what our happy thought was. Great idea, Mom. Well, we better get going. We want to have enough time to read the bulletin before the service starts. Okay, I'm sure by just listening to you that that does typify your uh, Sunday morning uh, pre-church experience. Uh, maybe not. Uh, so going back to what I was saying a few moments ago, it's, it's, it's the prism through which we're going to try and look at this passage this morning, but God getting the people ready, and despite all the distractions, and for all that's going wrong, even in your pre-Sunday, uh, pre-church uh, experience today, that you're coming to listen to God, and how God might speak to you. We're going to do that by reflecting in Exodus chapter 19 here, and it and I think what this passage in many ways summarizes is, is the characteristics that typified these people as they were coming to listen uh, to God. And this is the bit that I'm really going to ignore from, from, from what I was doing in, in my sermon. I'm just going to state what these things are. Uh, but as they were coming to worship at the foot of the mountain, there were roughly two million uh, Israelites now at this point, and it's only 60 days after having left uh, their, their position of, of slavery. And at this mountain, they come now to worship God, but God was getting them ready. And the characteristics in many ways that might summarize the, the people who are ready to listen, ready to move on with God to the next stage. And as I look at the people here, some of the things I'm going to, I would have been picking out, were that there are people who can remember God's faithfulness. That's in verse 4. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings. Just that little reminder that here were a people who were very aware of how God had looked after them, how God had been faithful. And so there's a sense here that we need to be people who are aware of what God has been doing in our past if we're going to be ready for the next thing. Or another thing that I see in this passage is that you need to have a sense that God can use you. And to be able to have that sense that God is able to use you, whatever it is in the future, is that where I believe it begins is that you have a proper understanding of how God actually thinks about you. And that's a hard thing to believe at times. If you look down to verse 5, you see here what God and his attitude towards the people of Israel. He says, now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, and here's the little bit, you will be my treasured possession. That is how God thinks about you. And I know we have a hard task believing that at times. So often we can think, we can look around at other people and we can see that they've got their lives together, they're sorted. God might be able to use them, but actually God could never use me because I can't believe and understand that God could view me as a treasured possession. But when we begin to have a proper understanding of how God has loved us, and I think... On Communion Sunday, it's a perfect day to remember that, is that when we know that and we believe that in our hearts, we can see that we can be a people whom God can use. And again, another little characteristic that I would have been bringing out uh, into verse 10, it's a sense actually that God was getting them ready. And he, to do that, they had to spend time listening to God. Verse 10, uh, where the Lord said to Moses, go, uh, to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Make them wash their clothes and to be ready. And during those three days, they were getting ready. They were spending time with God. And so if we as a people are expecting 
God to be able to use us into the future to do something significant. We need to be spending time with him. But the chief characteristic, I think, is also in verse 11, where I can simply describe it as being a people who are expectant, where it says, be ready, in verse 11, by the third day. In many ways, that verse is so, so significant for us because God, when he's working in our lives, we have to be an expectant people. And that when we're coming through the doors, when we're coming into this place, and we're, we would have a desire that God would, would move among us, we need to expect, we need to want that. And when God appears, and when God does come among us, and perhaps today you might think to yourself, wouldn't it have been great to have been there at Mount Sinai, listening, seeing this incredible appearance of God. I mean, we've already read that today, the, 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 the mountain trembling and the smoke that was billowing literally like a furnace. But to be there and to see that, and you would say, if I was in that immediate presence of God, wouldn't that have been terrific to see that, experience that? But again, we forget the reaction of the people of Israel when they were actually there. Because if you notice uh, what their reaction was, and that's maybe verses maybe through 18 and 19, it says, Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up uh, like smoke from a fountain, and the mountain trembled violently. Uh, but it's, and as things were getting louder and louder. But turn over to chapter 20 and verse 18. And you see the reaction of the people at the end of verse 18. It says, they trembled with fear and they stayed at a distance. It's actually when God comes afresh. It can be a frightening experience. Are we ready for that? To come close to God. And as frightening and as daunting as that might have been, to be there in that Old Testament experience of God, what I'm going to suggest to you today and where I'm going with my sermon now is actually what we have in the New Testament is far, far better, far more significant than anything that these Old Testament people experienced. No matter how frightening that they might have in, say, in, saying the word endured that in some ways because there's a frightening aspect to all of that. Right now, I want you to turn with me in your Bible to a different passage. I want you to turn with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 12. And if your page numbering is the same as mine, it's page 1,211. And what this passage does is that this passage is showing up the shortcomings of the Old Testament experience of God and is showing us what is far better in Jesus and why what we have is far superior to anything that the Old Testament guys had. And the Old Testament, as we're saying here, was summarized by Mount Sinai, where the law was, it was such a, a significant event that it actually described the nation of Israel. It was, their, it was their icon, as it were, that really described them, this mountain, Mount Sinai, where the law was given. And the New Testament writers compare that to the heavenly mountain, Mount Zion. And that's what we enjoy in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so this passage, Hebrews chapter 12, is showing what we have is so much better. So I want to read this passage with you. In my heading, I don't know if yours is exactly the same, but it literally, it is showing the difference, even in the heading at verse 18, where it's showing the difference between the mountain of fear, which is Mount Sinai, and the mountain of joy, which is Mount Zion. Let's read from verse 18. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and that is burning with fire, 
to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. Even if an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you, you have come to Mount Zion the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. That's saying what we have today is far better than anything that these Old Testament guys ever had or ever experienced. Now, what the Old Testament is is repeating and trying to emphasize time and again is that God was always remote from the people. He never came totally close. So even in the passage that we've read, you will have picked up that Moses was running up and down that mountain the way you run up and down the stairs at home. Uh, And there's always this sense that God came from heaven and he came to the top of that mountain and he called Moses up from the valley and Moses came up on behalf of the people to the top of the mountain and so that Moses was the one who stood between God and stood between the people and that the people never came totally close to God. And Moses was constantly running up and down that mountain. If I was going back to Exodus chapter 19, it says in verse 3, Moses went up. In verse 7, it says he went back down. In verse 8, he went back up. Verse 14, he's going back down. Verse 20, he's going back up. And the next verse, it's immediate. He says, go back down to the people. And actually, the whole time that the nation of Israel were camped at Mount Sinai, Moses was up and down that mountain seven times. And the point is, you Moses was the one who stood between God and the people. But in the New Testament, in Jesus, what we have is so much better because we know that Jesus came in human flesh and that Jesus came and lived among us and that he was among us and that Jesus did that because of the problem of our sin and that In humanity, in his human flesh, he bore our sin and he paid the price of our sin. And he paid the price that he never needed to pay. And he did that on the cross as he hung on the cross, as he endured the cross. He paid the price of our sin so that we who were guilty might go free. And that is why we celebrate Mount Zion. That is why we celebrate the gospel of Jesus Christ because we know that our sins and the guilt that we have and the shame that we carry is that Jesus paid the price for it. And that's why we rejoice and that's why we say that what we have in the New Testament is so superior to what they have in the Old Testament, even as frightening and as scary as it was and as immediate as it might have been with the thundering and the shaking and all that was going on. But actually, I'm going to go back to Hebrews 12 now because the writer doesn't stop there because the writer goes on to say that there were two events that occurred at Mount Sinai that are repeated. And the first one of those is mentioned in verse 25 of Hebrews chapter 12. And the first thing that happened at Mount Sinai and that is being repeated and is repeated now is that the voice still speaks. Verse 25, See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven. Back in the Old Testament, God literally spoke from the mountain. The difference is today is that God speaks to us from heaven. 
And what we have in the scriptures is the voice of God, God speaking to our hearts, speaking directly to us. And that, in many ways, is a warning that we need to take note in verse 25. It is not an insignificant matter to wait upon God. We don't want to listen to God in a glib fashion. And that's why I was asking at the beginning, has God been speaking to you about something? Has God been getting you ready so that you are ready for a new thing and that God is speaking into your life so that even as you come into this place or if you're at home and you're reading the scriptures, you have a sense that you know the clear calling of God upon your life and how God is prompting and that that is an unmistakable voice and that that is speaking into the depths of your being. And some of you will know the very clear urging of the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit is making the voice of God clear in your experience so that you know you need to obey this. So that's the first thing that's repeated from Sinai, is that the voice still speaks. The second thing is still future. And it's in Hebrews 12, verse 26. And it's the fact is that the earth will again shake. Verse 26, at that time his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised once more I will shake not only the earth but the heavens. See, a time is coming when God will shake the earth and the heavens again and he will come down. And that day we know as judgment day when God remakes all things. It will be a day when all will appear before God and we will give an account of ourselves. And the question then from this passage is how do we respond to what this passage is teaching us? I've been reading this passage, Exodus 19, Hebrews chapter 12, through this prism of the fact that God is getting you ready so that you are at the point where he is able to speak in a new way, so that it is a day of new beginning, a day when God is going to work anew in your life or in the life of our church. You today have the privilege of coming to Mount Zion. You know that Jesus Christ has paid the price for your sin upon the cross and upon the tree and the voice of God speaks. And the very first thing that we need to be assured of and to know and to experience is that God has called me into eternal life and that I will no longer stand back and say, I will be hesitant about following him and that I will come to him in faith and that I will accept his free offer of grace and forgiveness and that I will follow Christ and that I will follow Christ wherever that takes me. The question still is for us, is are we ready for the next move of God? In your life, in the life of this church, Let's pray. Lord, speak and make us receptive to your voice. May we sit loosely to the things of this world because we know that our heavenly abode heavenly Mount Zion, to where you have called us is our ultimate longing. Lord, give us ears to hear, hearts to respond, that we might be attentive to your voice. Amen.